Hi, this is Jim Janesey, and we're now on Chapter 17 of the Story of Art. This is the last chapter we'll cover in Unit 4. And what we'll be looking at this time is Northern Europe, Germany and the Netherlands, as the Renaissance progresses. And Gombrich entitles his chapter, The New Learning Spreads. This is where Renaissance concepts spread from Italy across the Alps into Northern Europe. And we'll take a look at how those concepts are employed to some degree by some and to a greater degree by others. We have here a picture of something where it looks like concepts of the Renaissance are sort of being dragged into, in this case, a building, probably by the client. And the architect is rather interested in preserving the Gothic architectural forms, but acquiesces to the use of some ornamentation of the Renaissance. So this is kind of a strange combination of styles. What we have here is non-functional pillar decorations, looks like Greek pillars, and round Roman arches, but included in the arch is this Gothic type of window decoration with tracery. Here, rather an unusual three half circles and one full circle. Here, a full quatrefoil window that is a round opening with four smaller circles in it. But of course, the building is laden, replete with all of this very well, overly ornate, I guess you could say, type of spire, Gothic decorations, as well as these kinds of gargoyles here that are actually rain gutters. The rain would come pouring out of here, and it almost looks like whatever beast that is is spitting. Here we have another building that is also a combination of styles, and once again you can see here that these are Greek columns, just sort of slapped onto the building, and the frieze here that's a Greek feature but statues that are kind of part of the Renaissance decoration of a building. Interesting frieze here, sort of a Renaissance technique. Looks like we hung on to a pointed type of an arch here. Kind of a strange mixture of these different styles. Once again, it seems that people want to see something of the Renaissance in buildings, but the architects are very stuck on the preservation of a lot of elements of the Gothic era that preceded it. Now we'll take a look at several works by Albrecht Dürer. We know a lot about Dürer because he kept a lot of notes and he also did a lot of self-portraits. He didn't do things by halves. Dürer here in creating this woodcut, he achieves more detail than most people would have with a woodcut, including gray shadings here that are really kind of difficult to achieve thin lines closely spaced so that it gives a shade of gray. But even more interesting here, he's taken the book of Revelation and he's interpreted it here in a very dramatic way. This almost looks like a crowded together assemblage of things, a piece of artwork from the Middle Ages in the sense that there's so much going on. But in fact, the main character here, this angel who's fighting the dragon, spoken of in the book of Revelation, is real malice in his face anger in his arms and he's got it at the throat of this dragon and he's just killing this thing dead. Meanwhile down here sits the placid countryside. This is all taking place in heaven. Durer combined the skills of an artist who could compose artwork like this as well as the skill of a person who could create woodcuts and then even more complex and difficult to achieve engravings. He also had talents as a watercolorist. He continually sought for methods by which he could achieve ever greater realism. Now here's a watercolor, and this is incorrect on the slide here. This is not a woodcut. This is actually a watercolor that almost looks photographic. And it's a very innocuous sort of a subject. It's called a piece of turf. So he's gone out and examined a piece of ground and just taken a look at all the different shades of green and all the different shapes of plants and the shading on them and the detail here with these tips of these weeds. And he's reproduced this in watercolor. It was just amazing, actually, the detail that he achieved and then the different colors and textures down here of the earth. It was just a study. It wasn't done for the purpose of anyone who commissioned this art. He just wanted to see how he might be able to replicate what he saw in nature and to do it very realistically in this medium of watercolor. Now we get to engravings. Engravings are much tougher to do, although they offer a lot more tonal range in terms of the shades of gray and the fineness of the lines that can be created. So here's a rather, it would seem, odd combination. We have a nativity scene, 
with Mary and Jesus here in this ramshackle, broken down sort of a structure, and a very old Joseph out here carefully pouring water from the well into a jug. And they're rather minor characters in this. It would seem that the real intent here, the real focal point of interest, is the old structure, with all this marvelous detail of a, an arch that's still standing, although the wall around it is collapsed, and this plank laid across here, just some sort of a ramshackle thing, and we see here bricks that are exposed because the plaster has fallen off. Just kind of an odd scene. It's composed in such a way that many things extraneous to the telling of the nativity story are included here, and included in such a way that it's obvious Durer knew a lot about Renaissance technique. I mean, for one thing, take a look here. If you extend these lines that recede into the distance back, you're going to come to some sort of a vanishing point. Something like this, and something like this. Any of these lines that, that somehow recede into a vanishing point, there is a vanishing point picked out for this. And it's obvious he's composed it in such a way that he takes note of that and has used a sketch to do it. But his real interest seemed to be in a lot of very unusual shapes and combinations here of dark and light. Now here's something interesting about Durer. He would always hang such a little ornament like this on here, a sign with a little handle to it. And it would say the date and an interesting sort of a monogram, a symbol that would look like this and that would have a D down here. So something that looked like that, you can actually see right there on this sign. Sometimes he would spell his whole name out. Always there'd be something identifying his work. Now this is an example of an engraving done in about the same period. And as Gombrich points out, the bodies here, although they look somewhat realistic, they look a little bit artificial, really. They don't look as artful as work of the Renaissance artists. And the reason is that Durer is actually trying to apply some method of measurement in order to place all these different ripples and lines on the body. He was seeking after some sort of a method by which he could do this and replicate a perfect shape by way of these repeated measurements. So it's an interesting idea and it results in some very interesting work here. Once again, the very fine quality of the engraving, you notice the shades of gray, the fine detail, and actually he was very proud of this. He didn't just put his monogram out there, he actually put in Latin, Albrecht Durer did this, 1504. Notice, interesting little thing here, the little sheep up on this promontory, and the scene here actually is the lion laying down with the lamb, and the story of Adam and Eve just about the time of the fall, here is the snake delivering the apple to Eve, and Adam is reaching for it as well. And of course, as soon as they indulge, they will discover that they're naked. However, we have here some very convenient foliage that is covering up the most private parts of their bodies, in spite of the fact that they don't yet realize that they're naked. Of course, we do, because we exist after the fall of man, and we're seeing a picture here of them before.